At this lunch, we'll be sharing our heart for Antioch Kids Ministry and how you can play a role in that. I can't wait to meet you. Yeah. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is TJ Sanford, and I have the honor of serving as the young adult pastor here at Antioch Baton Rouge. Uh, where are my young adults at? Good bit of you guys. Super stoked. I am really excited to be teaching this morning. Uh, we are starting our brand new series, like Jonathan had mentioned. Uh, it's a four-week series through the season of Advent, and today is actually Advent Sunday. That's in the liturgical calendar. Today is the very beginning of Advent, leading all the way through the next four weeks to Christmas Eve, where it culminates. And so uh, over the next four weeks, we'll have uh, a couple different guys um, and myself. I'll be ending on our fourth week teaching through uh, the Advent season, uh, as well as doing a little bit of like character studies, looking at uh, people throughout the Bible uh, and what uh, Advent looked like for them and what then that means for us and for our lives. And so I am really, really excited to kick this off today, because today we're going to talk a little bit about what Advent is, which I think is a pretty decent starting point for an Advent series. Uh, and so what we're going to do is we are going to start in the Word of God, as we always do. So if you have your phone, if you have your Bible, take that out, go to your Bible app or whatever you got, and we're going to Isaiah chapter uh, 9. Isaiah chapter 9, we'll start in, uh, in verse 2. And then we'll jump from verse 2 to verses 6 and 7. This is actually a traditional Advent reading that you see at more Orthodox uh, churches. And so I'm really excited to kind of read through this together and then kind of see what this lays out for us moving forward. So let's read. And actually, if you will, stand with me as we read the Word of God. Again, Isaiah chapter 9, starting in verse 2. It says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. Verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. On the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Will you pray with me? Lord God, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for the gift that is Advent. And I, I pray this morning, Father, that, um, that we wouldn't just be hearers of the word of God, but doers of the word of God. I pray that every heart would be a heart ready to receive I pray that here and now, God, would you change us? Would, would, this, would this morning mean something for your church? Not just a day for it to enter into our minds and back out, but rather into our hearts and deep into our souls. And Father, we thank you again that we have one more Saturday, Saturday to remind Texas A&M that they're barely a part of the SEC. <laughs> Amen. Go Tigers. Grab a seat, guys. Sorry, Aggie fans. I didn't even know y'all were going to be here. I was just ready for that. So that's, I'm so excited. But anyway, uh, today is a really awesome day. Um, like I said, we're teaching through Advent, and this is really fun for me because as I've thought more about this, as we started to talk about this, um, I don't know about you, but it seems like in conversation, some of you guys grew up celebrating Advent. Some of you know what it is, exactly what it is, and have practiced and observed and then there's a big group of, I'll, I'll, I've noticed a lot more young adults maybe, uh, have no idea what Advent is. If, if you've heard of it, it's one of those things where it's like, cool, explain it, and you're like, I got no clue where to start, and I have no clue where to finish. It's a thing we do. Uh, and so for me, I never grew up celebrating Advent um, up until uh, me preparing for this sermon. Um, I had zero clue what Advent meant, uh, for, thankfully now I do, for your sakes, uh, now that I'm up here. Uh, but it's funny because we were in our teaching team uh, meeting, and we were kind of laying out our teaching calendar uh, for the next couple months, and the idea was thrown around to do an Advent series. And I was stoked. I was like, yeah, that's great. Let's do it. That's awesome. So then I, I took out my phone, I started to adjust my fantasy football lineup and send out my weekly trade requests that some of you get probably, and deny, and, uh, and then that's when I again heard my name, 
and, and realized that I had been talked about as starting the series on Advent that I knew nothing about. So that led me into a lot of studying, as I normally do, but this time it's a little bit different. But as I dug more and more into the idea, the notion of Advent, I got really excited about what it means, uh, not just for us as a church, not, what, not just what it means for us uh, as the church at large around the world, but even what it means for me personally. And so I'm really excited for us to be able to go through this together. Um, and so uh, if you're taking notes, please take notes. It's awesome. I think this will be a really great opportunity for us to, to learn a lot together. Uh, but let's talk about for a second why Advent is important and what Advent really is. First and foremost, what's really cool is that Advent, um, the church has been celebrating at least since the 400s AD. That's a long time. And that's one thing I really love, because while we are a non-denominational church and a non-denominational movement, um, sometimes we can lose a bit of the, the, the traditions of the church, um, and we can lose a little bit of the long-lasting traditions of the church, and so it can feel like everything's brand new, and it's kind of just flying by the seam of your pants, but what's really cool is almost like, a, like communion. One thing I love about communion when we do it is um, it is for a moment a connection for us to our past and to our present. In that moment, we are celebrating with every Christian around the world, doing the same thing, saying the same things, believing the same things, whether they're underground or not, but at the same time, we're celebrating what Christians have done for millennia, in ancient tradition, and Advent is not dissimilar. In doing so, and in celebrating it, we have a connection to our forefathers and foremothers of the faith, and so that's a really cool opportunity for us to recognize that what we're doing is not like Antioch, Baton Rouge decided to do an Advent series. No, no, no. The Church of Jesus Christ celebrates Advent, and it has a very specific purpose for us. And so I'm very excited for that. Um, the word Advent actually comes from the Latin word Adventus, which comes from the uh, transliteration of the Greek word uh, parousia. Can you say parousia? Parousia. Nailed it, guys. Way to go. Uh, and parousia means uh, a coming or an arrival, and even specific, specifically in a technical sense, almost like a royal visit, a royal arrival. So you would hear in the ancient world uh, that there is a parousia of Caesar in any major city, the coming and the arrival of, of the leader of the nation, of the empire. And so this is where the word draws from, but we also see this throughout the New Testament, um, almost specifically and only used uh, for the idea of the second coming of Christ. So in Matthew 20, uh, 24, 37, it says, For as were the days of Noah, so will be the parousia, or the coming of the Son of Man. What Advent does for us is it sets our, our eyes on the past and on the future. It's meant to, for us, build an anticipation and a preparation for Christ and his coming. And for that, we see those two very specific instances. It's not just one. It's, it's two big ones. It's looking for us. Advent kicks off four weeks before Christmas. And so it's for us, the advent, the arrival of Christ that we are preparing our hearts for, preparing our souls for, and anticipating with hope what happens in God's coming into the world. Now, again, it also looks for, and traditionally has been, a look toward Christ's second coming as well. It's for us to look forward to that day and time that either Christ comes to us or we go to him. Because I don't know if you know this, but the human uh, mortality rate still hovers around 100%. And so there is a chance that you would go to Christ before he comes back. But regardless, it is still for us every day. And that way, Advent is every day. But it's for us, specifically in this month, to prepare and to hope. So the question then is, is, why do we need Advent? Well, in that scripture we just read, Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 2, he says that the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Um, and in this, what Isaiah is doing, because he's, he's saying this hundreds of years before Christ's coming into the world, Right? And so what he's doing is he's actually trying to pull our minds back to the creation, to Genesis, wherein God creates uh, humanity, creates man to rule over the world, and that should be noted, not to dominate the world, but rather to cultivate, to grow, 
to love, but man does yet fail, right? Then what God does in his foresight, um, he actually says, well, then I will choose then a nation to achieve the same goal, and that nation being Israel. That Israel would then, hopefully, lead the world into righteousness and holiness. Now, we know that that didn't happen either. Then he moves on to a lineage within Israel, which is what we call the Davidic line, or the family tree of King David, which at the very end is Jesus Christ. And so, in this, he is trying to show us that this world is a fallen one. He uses the word darkness, which... uh, when he's speaking in his Hebrew tongue, he's saying this word, choshek. Can you say choshek? You can do the, do the whole, the throat thing to choshek, yeah, hakdalugi. You're doing great. What this really means is more so than just darkness. It's this tone of extreme darkness. In Hebrew literature, it's used even for the idea of miners being in a mine. The darkness that's to be in the pit in the darkest, darkest, darkest places. And I know odds are most of us haven't been in a mine before. Um, So the closest thing we have is probably rolling out of bed at 3 a.m. to get water in the kitchen. And it's like pitch black and your toe somehow has a magnet in it to the metal piece on the ottoman, right? And it's just like for some reason, it's always the same piece of furniture that you hit. I don't know why, but for me it's our ottoman and it just crushes you. And, and, and then you, of course, stumble into the kitchen and forget in your dreariness that the light of a thousand suns will come on when you light it up, right? And you're blind. But this is this notion of utter darkness that Isaiah speaks of when he talks about a world in darkness that a sun will come into, the sun. And so I think, and I would feel pretty safe in saying that most of us have an insight into the fact that there is darkness. We have insight into the notion that we um, exist within what feels like a pit, a mine. And, And I think that Jesus makes this clear, at least when he says that when he sees us, that we are like sheep without a shepherd, wandering, aimless, without purpose or destination. And I will say that we might even say deep in us, like, have you ever felt the need, the desire to see an end to injustice? Poverty, war, disease. I think we all do. Have you ever desired within yourself to notice internally the the, the hope and desire for an end to anxiety, worry, stress, depression, loneliness, whether it's internally uh, imposed or even externally exposed. If for a moment you think, like, no, I'm good. There's a problem in the world? Since when? Like, I don't, I think if that were the case for most of your life, 2020 changed that probably. Like, 2020 in us changed our insight into what the world actually is. It felt like for a while we saw the worst of what it could be, Um, all you really had to do was log into Facebook to realize that everyone and their aunt, uh, probably your aunt, found a problem with the world, right? Like everyone's exposing every single problem that they could ever imagine, and some of them very real, some of them very imagined. But regardless, there are problems and people see it. What's more is, is everyone's got their own solution, right? Yeah, if you don't have a viable solution to lend to the social media atmosphere, you're an outcast, right? Like, you have to have your opinion. Uh, And and the crazy thing is, time and time again, while while problems are being pushed forward, while we see that across our atmosphere and the ethos of our world, there are problems that have existed forever, right? Like, most of the problems that you're going to see have existed throughout time. I know that at times it's being said that um, today, the day we live in now, is um, it's never been like this before. This is the worst it's ever been. I hate, as a, as a history nerd, I, ha- I hate to burst your bubble. That's not true. Time has been bad for a while, um, actually. 
And, and so all that to say is, is that when we come up with problems, you probably also notice that we just continue to stumble through it and there still isn't a solution. And I am not, certainly, not against posing potential, re, uh, you know, resolutions to problems. That, that would be crazy. Um, but what we have to recognize is the problem with the world isn't wrongness as the world defines it. It's not wrongness as the news would define it. It's not wrongness as your neighbor or your family or even myself would define it. Wrongness is how God defines it, and what God defines is sin, that sin is the problem with the world, which is why time and time again, you'll see, hey, I've, I've got this problem, and I've got this solution. You know, I, I, I think I said at one of our recent young adult services and that, that, like, I understand that. Having struggled deeply with depression and anxiety and OCD, um, recognizing that there are uh, good good practical solutions there. There is therapy. There is medicine. Those things are great. But if it's not paired with the healing of Jesus, then it's just going to be a band-aid on a gash, right? Like it's just, it, it, it helps, but it doesn't fix it. And so for us, when we start to see these problems, uh, what happens is, is if we say, man, but if X happened, then everything would be fine. Man, if Y became the president, everything would be back in order. That's a lie. It's not true, and we won't see that happen. So I think for us it's important to recognize that this world is broken, that darkness, the pit, is real for all of us and has been. But this is where Advent starts to come in, the notion of Advent. Um, for us, Advent, like we've read in Isaiah, and we'll read a second in a second, is that it's that light breaks through that darkness. That the sun, the sun, Jesus, being the light in darkness breaks through it. He says in Isaiah 2 and 6, he says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has light shone. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulder." And his name shall be Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, and Prince of Peace. I do think it's important in light of what we just acknowledged together about the darkness of the world. <laughs> I'll take any of those names. Do you know what I mean? Like, I will take peace, I'll take might, I'll take the everlasting, I'll have counsel. Like, all those things, yes, please, we need it. And this is the promise of the foreseen Christ by Isaiah and his prophecy. Um, I think for us what's really cool in this season of Advent is that Advent calls us to look forward. Advent calls us to hope for and in the coming Christ. We even for the moment take the moment to look and see that the Christ has come. And as Christmas is approaching, where we celebrate the birth of Christ, is that here and now on Advent Sunday, we have, I'm so glad Jonathan talked about it, uh, the devotional, that day by day by day by day, we get to be prepared and build anticipation for Christ's coming or the preparation of our hearts and souls for our going to him. So I think that um, Advent, has three major callings on us, that there's three major callings of Advent, three uh, things that for us should uh, mark our Advent uh, season, personally and corporately. The first one is a call to patience. Advent does, while call us, calling us to look forward and to hope, um, and, and while Isaiah was looking forward, so for example, right, he's saying a son has come, a child is born. This is 700 years before that's actually true. 700 years. People were living in castles 700 years ago, right? Like, we're like, not everybody. Some people got to live in castles. But regardless, uh, that's like, it's a big, wide gap. But he's talking about this God in the present, right? And so for us, th this idea of patience is an important one because he's saying it is coming and our foresight should be constant and it will take waiting. It will take patience. And, that, and there is a difference, I should state, between waiting and patience. Waiting can be mindless. Waiting can be in the doctor's office, right? You're just sitting there in the waiting room and what have you. Patience 
is waiting with hope. It's a hopeful expectation that is bigger than just sitting around and waiting. But there is a problem, because there always is. I'm not, not meant to expose you guys, um, but you're terrible at waiting. All of you. Uh, I'm worse than you, I promise. Uh, but we as a, as a species, I guess, whatever, humanity as a whole is just awful at waiting. I mean, I'm really bad. So, like, I'm the guy that fast walks everywhere. Like, at, it doesn't matter. I'm fast walking constantly. I'm the one that pulls up to a stoplight, and I count the cars in either lane to see which one has one less car so I can shave two seconds off of my arrival time right? I'm the one that puts in my Google Maps my destination, and it says, hey, you're going to show up at 148. I said, watch me. I'm getting there at 145, right? Like, there's this constant, constant hurry within us, and, and I mean, some of us have now graduated to having our phones on our wrists, right? Because you're like, could you imagine if I had to take one more second to grab my phone out of my pocket to return a text? That's crazy. I'd be living in the 90s, right? Like, this is, this is like the mentality. Everything is faster. Everything is for us looking to. And, be, and beyond that point, I think it, in our culture, in a Western, specifically an American culture, we even look at our lives, and if someone walks up to you and says, hey, how you doing? I'm doing great. I'm just busy. Nobody hears, I mean, come on, I'm the worst, I'm seriously the worst offender. I say that all the time. So I'm not saying this because I'm great. I'm saying this because I need prayer. But the thing is, is like legit, when we do that, when I'm saying I'm just busy, I'm not, like nobody's response is, oh my gosh, can I help? Well, that's not the, and I'm not even saying I want help. In that moment, it's, it's, it's for us, those, those, that statement is gaining social credit, right? Honestly. Because if someone were to say, hey, how you doing? And I was like, doing great. I've just been doing a ton of reading, take a lot of naps, um, going a lot of walks. You'd be like, so John's lazy, (laughs) right? Like this is the mentality that we've built up within ourselves is that like busy is good. Busy equals good. Busy equals productivity. But in reality, it really, it really doesn't. This life of hurry uh, builds within us this busyness, this overload, materialism, careerism, all of this leading into a cycle of stress and anxiety, a chronic state of restlessness, which then just leads to anger and depression, angst and anxiety. And that tends to just roll out of control leading to us probably burying problems. I know I'm, I do that a lot and compartmentalize it until it just festers and festers and festers and gets worse and worse. Corey Ten Boom, the famous writer, she said once, if, if the devil can't get you to sin, he'll get you to be busy. Right? And, and she's right. She's right. I think that we recognize all that, um, again, All it really does is find us, the more busy we become, I don't know if anybody in this room, if I said, hey, raise your hand if you're super busy, and raise your hand if you just feel like you've been knocking everything out and life is awesome. No, no, the busier you are, it's like, and I feel the weight of it, completely. The thing about Advent that's so cool, in this notion of of patience, is it calls us to slowing down. It calls us to a joyful expectation, but to take our lives and to quiet. This, this for me, I can say is probably one of the most difficult disciplines, to be honest. This is super hard for me. Um, I think it might be probably for all of us, but I think in this Advent season, step one has to be slowing. Taking a look at our lives and saying, where, where have I just added too much? I think Jonathan, I'm so glad last week, talked about building margin in our lives because it is important. He made the great point that, that even the Lord Jesus would have to, knowing that his life was running and gunning all the time, that he would have to take moments to be away, to be in the quiet, to be in the silence, and to allow God to speak. The second thing that is a calling for us within this Advent season that Advent calls us to is a call to presence. Um, not with a T, not presence, but presence, being present, being present. Um, Isaiah says in verse 6, for to us a child is born and a son is given. 
God receives the great name Emmanuel. God with us. I would venture to say, and I would maybe posit the idea, that maybe God's greatest gift that he's ever given is his presence. Because when we receive God's word, it's due to his presence, right? He shows up and then we hear from him. Or when we're reading scripture and suddenly it's illuminated to us, his presence is there with us. And he has illuminated for us his words. God's presence is, presence is undeniable as his greatest gift, I believe. I would say, uh, I remember um, I was in high school at the time, I believe. And uh, <clears throat> I started to feel really sick. And so my mom gave me some medication. Because I, I had my driving test. I was getting my permit. So I must have been 15 or 16, whatever. Um, and so my, the, the guy that's doing my driving test shows up at my house. He picks me up. And we're driving. About 30 minutes into my drive, I start to weave off the road <clears throat> and start to fall asleep at the wheel. My mom didn't know she gave me drowsy medication. Uh, and I didn't know, because who doesn't trust their mom? I'm like, yeah, mom, if you give me medication, it's going to be great. So I'm falling asleep at the wheel. This guy's freaking out, obviously. So eventually, he jumps in the driver's seat, and I, I get in the passenger seat, and I just fall asleep while this man drives me home. And uh, <laughs> it wasn't my best moment, but it wasn't the worst, probably. Uh, and... So eventually, I, so I get home, and I get in bed, and I'm telling you, it is the worst sickness I've ever had in my entire life. I was throwing up. I couldn't eat. I couldn't drink. I couldn't sleep. It was awful. I mean, I'm sure some of us have had that experience where you just, like, everything hurts. And, and uh, I remember the only way that I could fall asleep is if my mom got in bed with me and just laid there. And, and like, if she would lay there with me, I could go to sleep. And this was like multiple nights where it was just like, and you know, when you're sick, you're like, literally all I want to do is fall asleep. I want to go to sleep and, and not feel all this and then wake up and I'm better, right? And, and just when she was there, her presence alone was able to kind of soothe me, to feel protected, and to fall asleep. And I'm sure you've felt that before, where in a moment you're like, I honestly, I feel so in that pit, so in that darkness, I, I don't need you to say anything, I just need you to be there right? We've felt that before. The great thing is that God is with us. God is Emmanuel, and we celebrate Advent. We're looking at his presence in the world, and we've felt it before. In those hard times, you probably do the same thing I do. You're a God, say something. Say anything. It's a silence. And then you do the, like, say something, God. Song of Solomon, that can't be it, right? Like that situation, and you're just like, flipping around but then in the in the moment that you're just like but I'm just gonna be here like I'm just gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna stay at it that there is inexplicably just a moment where you know God is present where it's just like a peace and there's a joy and there's a hope and it's in, I couldn't and, and if you've experienced that you know exactly what I'm talking about you can't explain it but the presence of God changes things and in Advent we are being called to being present, to slow and to be present with God, looking forward in this hopeful anticipation. And I believe that those two pieces are massively important to this season. So I wonder for you, like, what does that look like? What does it look like for you to slow? What does it look, look like for you to, be just, to just be present? And we'll get into some of those practicals later. But be considering that as we talk. The third thing that Advent calls us into is actually action. Uh, Advent calls us to prepare, right? So, so I believe that the, 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 the patience and being present are moments of building anticipation for us as we allow our hearts and mind to focus on the coming Christ. And then thirdly, as action, it's the preparation of our hearts and souls, I think that um, St. Augustine said it really well. I'm a huge Augustine fan, so you've probably heard me say his name a lot. But he said this this way when talking about prayer and the hopeful expectation. He said, <clears throat> why God, he, should ask us to pray when he knows what we need before we ask him may perplex us if we don't realize that our Lord and God doesn't want to know what we want. 
for he can't fail to know it, but wants us rather to exercise our desire through our prayers so that we may be able to receive what he's preparing to give us. His gift is very great indeed, but our capacity is too small and limited to receive it. Simply by making us wait, he increases our desire, which in turn enlarges the capacity of our soul, making it able to receive what's going to be given to us. So what he's saying is, the waiting, which I know we've all felt that, like why is God not answering my prayer? Well, it's hard, because sometimes we're like, God, I have this huge problem. I got about five minutes, and if you could hit that in the next five minutes, that'd be awesome. And God's going like, so you don't really want this then. Like there's so five minutes, like, again, I'm preaching at myself, right? Like I, this is not a youth, this is a me thing. I'm the worst, the chief of sinners in this, right? But what he's doing, I, I was thinking actually just last night, I was hanging out with Alex and Holly and, uh, and Brooke and, and we were... Um, we were making pasta for dinner, and it's this, this fun process of, like, you make the dough, and you put it through, um, help me, a pasta roller is what it's called, and it's fun because basically you take, like, a lump, and you put it into the roller, and it starts, like, it's two rollers, and it's kind of wide, and you kind of just, like, roll it, and it comes out, and progressively, you, like, you close it a little bit more. Like, it gets a little bit tighter. And so as you're doing it, it's becoming thinner and thinner. And this thing that was, like, this big becomes, like, this big. It's huge. I think that it's a very similar process. Thanks, Matt. Uh, I knew it was a good story. Uh, But what's great is it's actually this really beautiful image of what this idea is. This is what Augustine's pointing to for us is, yeah, it's not just a like, boom, it's done, it happened. But this progressive, I mean, you, we put that dough through there like eight times before it's ready. I wonder for us, like, what that would look like for us to be constantly preparing our hearts in the same way, to receive what exactly God wants us to receive. What he wants you to receive. And I think what we're thinking about that, like, what, what is that thing? What is the preparation? Is it, is it prayer? Is God calling you into deeper prayer in the season? Is God calling you, for, calling you to a fast? Is God calling you to read, read his word? For identity. Like, maybe, maybe you're in an identity crisis, and the only place that you're able to go to is Instagram right now. Right? Waiting for comments and likes and shares and whatever to build up who you think you are who who you should be maybe it's drawing back to you the word of God maybe it's to just slow down and meditate maybe it's to start your day literally just shut up and sit down and be there just just be there take take five minutes take ten minutes and just be just be quiet be silent be still and listen Maybe it's for you to be present. Where would your presence change things? Like, where would your presence in this city change things? Where would your presence in this church, in your life group, in discipleship, with your coworkers, with your friends, with your family, with God himself, where would your presence change things? I think even in this moment, maybe there's faces coming to mind, places coming to mind. Jot it down. Pull out your phone, pull out your, the notepad, write it down. Like, don't forget that and lean into it. Because what's great about this Advent season, and I think we get swept up in this sometimes, is we find ourselves celebrating Christmas. Um, when in reality, we don't celebrate Christmas. Christmas celebrates Christ's coming. Christmas is but a tool for us to celebrate the coming of Christ. So in the moments that we get swept up and we're like, Christmas is about family. It's really not. Or gifts or food. Those are great benefits. I mean, they're awesome benefits. But Christmas celebrates Christ's coming. And we are participating and looking forward to that moment that we might know Christ Jesus. So for us, to what we we say to the world, what we know within ourselves in this Advent season, Christmas is that we 
await a God who saves. We await a Christ who is a light breaking through the darkness. We celebrate a God who saves us, not just once, but over and over and over and over again. His salvation is for us every single day. And so it's important to recognize that while Advent does, yes, celebrate Christ's coming at the Nativity in Bethlehem, And while, yes, it does celebrate his second coming, whenever that is, there's a third one right in the middle, which is Christ's coming into our hearts and into our lives. The advent, the arrival of Christ in our hearts. Today, there are two people here. One of you um, loves the Lord, but it's been rough. It's been, it's been a rough, rough year, rough week, whatever. And what you need to know is that while, though it may seem dark, Christ is near. I've heard it said before, uh, you know, if you walk outside and you were to look at the sun, pretty much the brightest thing we have, right? You look right at the sun, what happens? You don't see bright light. You see darkness. Your eyes can't even contain that amount of light. That doesn't mean the sun is gone. Rather, maybe too near, don't look at the sun. It's not a good idea. Don't do that. But for us, I do wonder for you. If you're in that place where you're like, I just feel like God's gone because all that I feel is darkness and pit. He's right there. And I think during Advent, this is a great opportunity to say, instead of just running and gunning and still feeling that, to slow, to be there, to listen, and to lean in, to prepare your heart for that day that is coming, because it is coming. And I know for me, this is one of those things that like, yeah, it's really hard sometimes to read and to pray and to fast, to do all that stuff, when you're like, cool, so this is forever. Sometimes it's just really easy to know, like, okay, but could you do it for the next month? For the next month, could you lean into those rhythms that, that you really have been wanting to do, but just felt like, how do, I, how do I grab that? How do I even start? Welcome to Advent Sunday. There's four more weeks, and Christ is coming. Have expectation that for you, wherever you are, that that day of his coming means something. It's not a day to come and go. There's something there, and for you to prepare and to be ready is a holy thing. The second person here, you, you haven't met with Jesus, and you don't know Jesus, and that pit is just as real. That anxiety is just as real. That depression is just as real. The great thing is for us, in John 4, Jesus meets a woman and she, and she is feeling the same way. She feels like her life has nowhere to go, nowhere to be. But even where it has existed, it's failed. And she tells Jesus, um, yeah, but when the Messiah comes, which to her just means something's got to give. She's not a religious person. She's like, yeah, when the Messiah comes, when there is restitution and resolution, then everything will be clear and everything will be fine. And he looks at her and he says, you don't have to wait any longer or look any further. I am here. Jesus says in Revelation, behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and I'll eat with him and him with me. Today, I want to pray with you guys. And I believe that this Advent season for us is not just going to be like every other Advent that this Advent season is going to change our lives, change our church, change our city. Because why wouldn't we? Why do it if if we felt like it was anything other? So if you'll stand, worship team, you can come up. I want to pray for us. And I want to believe with you. We're going to worship. If you need prayer, we'll have our, our prayer team up here too. I would really encourage you, if you feel like if any of that darkness pit notion for you felt very real, Please do not leave without getting prayed for. We want to pray for you. We want to be there with you. 
So let's pray. Lord, Lord, we thank you for this season. We thank you for Emmanuel, God with us. Yes, you are coming, but yes, you are here now. So I pray for every heart, God. Let it be soft. Let it be prepared in these moments to receive you. And we do. With hopeful expectation, we receive you this morning. Carry us through this season, God. Heal in this season, Father. Show us in the silence who you are.